<laughs> you would never tire of that. So on the face of it, you might think we've got two rather unlikely competitors here. Austin Healy from the 60s, TBR from the 90s. Think about it though, and it makes more sense. This was the big, brutish, no-nonsense sports car of the 60s, and this was much the same from its own era. Big engine, small car, takes a lot of skill to handle it. So actually on the face of it, they're quite similar, but does the spirit of the raw, brutal Healy live on into the 90s with the TVR Chimera? Let's find out. But first, our friends at Lancaster Insurance are giving you the chance to win this Sealy 12 volt cordless power tool kit, including hammer drill, ratchet wrench, impact driver, and more. Click the link in the description to enter, and good luck. So we said they're the same, but very different. And they really are different. I've only done like half a mile so far in this Healy 3000, and it's a lot harder to drive than the TBR. Not through any design faults, but because the basic age of the car is, is so much greater than the TBRs. This is a 67 example of the big Healy. It's what they call the BJ8, but really it, it drives more like a late 40s, early 50s car in some ways. It's not dissimilar to an XK120, 140. You, you've got to use two hands on the steering wheel. Everything takes that little bit more effort stopping distances and everything, you know, you're in no doubt that you're driving a much, much older car. But on the other hand, here we are in a little village, there's a 30 limit, we're doing 30, and we're just chugging along on, you know, 1,000 RPM. And that, that's how they got the speed out of these. A big, for the time, torquey engine, uncomplicated. That's when both of these cars score, really. They took a sort of blue chip, workaday engine, put it in a sports car and trounced, you know, some real exotics. And the Healy as well, on the motorsport stage internationally, they achieved greatness. And, you know, the recipe was simple, but it was effective, devastatingly effective. I take my hat off to the people who managed to manhandle these round mountain courses with the heat of the exhaust melting their shoes. That happened. You're so close to the wheel and, you know, you, you feel like in the slightest impact, your head's going to hit the header rail here. But, you know, they didn't care and they just gave it death and they won. It's got a lovely, robust feel to it, the big Healy. You can see why they won rallies, uh, just, just by going and going and never falling apart. It really feels like a sort of no-nonsense, kind of strongly built car made out, out of old girders, you know. It's not a high revving engine, the C-Series, but it's got a nice crisp sort of feel to it in the mid-range. It, it, it does feel like it'll go pretty much in any gear. There's a Fiesta in front of us, we're doing 50, top gear. I just know we could be straight past him if I wanted to. There's some traffic lights coming up, I'm not sure about the brakes. Haven't had to brake hard yet. Hey, no, they're all right. Hey, what about that? So we've got a straight bit of road here. Let's uh, open it up to what happens. We've got an overdrive as well. So that's overdrive out, overdrive in. There's a lot of noise at whatever speed. It really makes you feel like you're motoring up. <laughs> Actually, it's intimidating at first, but once you get into it, this is lovely. It's a proper white knuckled sort of machine. You actually don't need to be up and down through the box all the time in these, they're so talky. You've got a bit of a bumpy ride in these cars. The, the rear sits quite low and there's, there's not a huge amount of suspension travel. It's a bit like the uh, TR Triumphs in that respect. But it does feel quite benign when you, you put it into a corner. I mean, bear in mind it's dry today and I probably wouldn't be even considering what it was like in the wet. It's definitely harder to drive than something like an E-Type, on, on first acquaintance anyway, but as I said, when you get used to it, it doesn't feel quite so demanding. It feels quite predictable really, as you'd expect. It just feels like it wants to go all the time. Even in top gear, it's, um, you know, it's talky. It's only about 145 horsepower, the, the BJ8. But it feels like a lot more, I have to say. If you were told it was as fast as a TBR, you'd probably not be inclined to disagree, really, until you thought about it afterwards. There is definitely a delight to mastering this car. Anyone could drive the TBR. You could, you could step out of your driving school car and drive the TBR and make a reasonable fist of it. But this, you, you've got to be used to old cars, and you've got to have some sort of mechanical sympathy. But that really is the appeal of cars of this age. And off we go again. is every bit as good as the TBR's V8 noise. I'm not sure I agree with that.
quite imagine that come the 1990s, what with increased emissions regulations and ever more rules about how safe a car had to be for both the occupants and anyone it ran over, that it wasn't possible to make a car as raw and as muscular as the Healy 3000. And there was some evidence to suggest that even that most mental of manufacturers, TVR, had conceded defeat. When it was launched, the Chimera was pitched at being a more grown-up bigger brother to the smaller Griffith. It was the softer, squidgier GT car of the range. Could have fooled me! The Chimera was always powered by a Rover V8, but even in its smallest, least powerful variant like we've got here, you've got 4 litres of capacity and 240 brake horsepower. If that wasn't quite enough for you, it grew throughout the Chimera's life to 5 litres and 340 horsepower. In a car that weighs less than 1200 kilograms, that makes this Blackpool Bruiser a monster in a straight line. Even this early Chimera 400 will still do 0 to 60 in 5 seconds. Jesus, does it shift! <laughs> and despite being allegedly the relaxed Grand Tour of the range, the Chimera was still every bit as raw as TVRs of old. There was no ABS, power steering was an optional extra, and there was no smooth automatic gearbox to handle the shifts for you, just this chunky five-speed manual. And even the styling of the Chimera is a bit gnarly. You'll notice that kind of slash cut just below the headlight. Rumour has it the factory dog bit into the clay styling buck for the Chimera, and the staff liked it so much they kept it in the production version of the car. And it must be said, I rather like it gives it that kind of aggressive, rough look to it. A bit like the noise. Ha ha ha, you would never tire of that. But by the 1990s, it wasn't enough for a car to just be shouty and fast and cheap. People wanted their sports cars to be a jack of all trades, so TVR put effort into the Chimera to make it a more well-rounded product. All the switches feel nice to the touch, they all do what they're supposed to, all the dials are reading normally, all the stitching is straight, the panels fit together properly, even the roof seals up well. It's not exactly a Mercedes SL, but it doesn't feel like a garden shed either. It's easy to look at that gnarly front bumper and hear that V8 rumbling away and imagine this is going to be some psychopath to drive. The thing is, the Chimera is longer than the Griffith. It's got a longer wheelbase, bigger overhangs, and it's got softer suspension. And that means it's not a twitchy beast on a limit either. The steering's sharp but not nervous, it's well weighted, the car rides well and there's just that little bit of body roll. It feels planted, it honestly doesn't feel like it would bite, it doesn't feel nervous. I'm not scared to use the power like you would have been in a TVR of the 80s. The Chimera looks like a tiger and it certainly sounds like one, but drive it and it's a bit of a pussycat really. The Chimera was a massive success. It went on to be TVR's best selling car. Small wonder really. It was proof that you could keep alive the spirit of those Brit bruisers of the 60s but make it just refined enough for a modern age. And when you're out of town, you've done your shopping, knock it down a bit and have a listen. Well, TVR sounds great, doesn't it? Really, really does. I just, just sat there revving the thing. It's incredible. This is the real deal, though. This is this is the '60s car. I mean, that it sounds brutal, doesn't it? And it it is brutal when you get your toe into it. But this one actually is just a little bit harder to drive. It's hard it's harder bizarre. work. That's an easy car to drive, isn't it? It's bizarre. You look at the two. The, the TVR's got these big slashes in the bonnet, and it sounds like an absolute beast. And you think it's going to be a handful, but actually, it's quite a gentle giant. Really, it's quite docile. Easy to drive as an MX-5, genuinely. Whereas the Healy looks kind of curvaceous and elegant, almost E-type like. Get it on the road, and actually, it's a bit of a brute. Yeah, you've got to put some effort in to drive these. It's a, it's a you know shoulder work to steer them, and I mean. All credit to the people, uh, men and women, who won international rallies in them because you know that must have been really hard work physically. Absolutely, there's a reason the Healy 3000 is a bit of a legend. I mean, we're not directly comparing these cars. If you want the Healy, 
the TVR is not going to do it for you. And equally, if you want the TVR, the Healy's probably not going to do it for you. But and there's about 60 grand between them. There is about 60 grand in it, but it must be said, it's still vaguely dry. I've got a V8 TVR, so I'm off for one more drive. See you soon. <laughs> I'm going to sign myself up to uh, take this up a mountain pass. Where's the door handle? <laughs>